Good morning. So I'm going to follow up uh, Dan here for it. So um, it's been a, 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 a big month in Illinois with regard to uh, taxes. Okay. But the, the flat tax versus the uh, the uh, the graduated tax and that part, everybody had passed the Senate yesterday? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Okay. So how many of you in here think that if you raise the taxes that your millionaires won't leave? <laughs> oh, no. Nobody in here believes that they won't leave. Well, that's actually pretty good because um, there was an article um, yesterday that I was reading that said, um, well, it was the other day, the big title mm -hmm. says, Will the Wealthy Flee? Right. So, will, will the Wealthy Flee Illinois? Yeah. So those who don't think that that'll happen, um, there was, it was ironic in that yesterday um, there was an article in um, Bloomberg. Here you here. Thank you. And the title of the article was Millionaires Flee Their Homeland as Tensions Rise and Tax Fights. So in the article it says about 108,000 millionaires migrated across borders last year at a 14% increase from the prior year. Um, any idea where the top three places that those people went to? Well, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a country, so not as a state, but as a country. So number one was Australia. Oh, okay. Number two, the United States. And why is that? What happened in 2018? Tax cuts. What? Right. What happened? So in 2018, everybody had a tax cut. Right? Oh. So you saw those people that were that were from other countries migrating to other countries where there were lower taxes. So if that happens on a world basis, or it, we think that could potentially happen on a state basis. Yeah, yeah. Right, I mean, this is the world. So this is 108,000 people from around the world, I well, didn't say who they were, right, that, that left wherever they were from. Okay, um, well, let, let me ask you this, the Milton. Sorry? How many states are like Illinois? Uh, because they were saying, I, I remember on something on the TV says, so many of these states have, you know, fair taxes, and then so I guess all taxes, so all taxes are unfair. So. Okay. <laughs> well, well yeah. As far as I'm concerned, yes, they, they are. are. You know, <laughs> they're, they're only fair to the person collecting, right? I mean, it's not, it's not fair to people. But you know, where, where the wealthy, I'm just saying, they were. I mean, that's what they said on the television. I mean, what that commercial? They say like so many states have, you know, where the, the wealthy pay their fair share, but instead of not in Illinois. So I'm wondering, what are the so, other states? So, so let, let's just get some straight. There, if it's a tax, it's a tax and it's unfair, right? But if it's a flat tax, everybody pays the same percentage, but not everybody pays the same amount. Okay. Right. I mean, if, if you make if you make a hundred thousand dollars and you make five million dollars, five percent is going to still be five percent. Okay. It's just that you're going to pay a lot more tax if you make more money. So, right. Okay. So. It's not. It has nothing to do with the percentages. The percentages. The percentages. Right. I mean, uh, it's like think of me, sir. If you have if you have money in the bank, right? Let's say you've got hundred thousand dollars in the bank and you're earning five percent. So you got five thousand dollars, right? If you have ninety thousand dollars in the bank, and you still earn five percent. You earn five thousand dollars. Okay. No, you make forty five hundred dollars, right? Because you don't have a hundred. You didn't have a hundred thousand. So the, the tax is all the tax is the tax. Okay, but right? I'm going to say so like, what which happened? One? Let me let me let me let me, let me, let me okay. finish. Okay. So state the last state to change from a flat tax to a progressive tax was Connecticut. Okay. Okay. About fifteen years ago. When Connecticut made the change, they said the exact same thing that they're saying in Illinois. People aren't paying enough, people don't make too much money enough for it. They said the tax rate would go down. Over the last 15 years, the average person pays 13% more in income taxes than what they pay before they had progressive tax, right? If taxes don't matter, then why do people buy their cigarettes and gas in Page County as opposed to buying it in Cook County? Uh, I thought maybe you want to put the corn on that. Why? Page County has lower taxes than Cook County does. Why do people drive over the state line to buy gas in Indiana versus buying gas in Illinois? Because the tax in Indiana is less than that, therefore, right? So, the whole thought about that people aren't paying their fair share, 
they pay more than their fair share because if you take into account all the tax areas, if they wanted to test this out, the easiest way to test it would be use zip codes, right? They would buy zip codes. We'll do sales tax. The state sales tax in well that we're picking that as a city, right? That should be 0.5% on picking up, right? While if it's in somewhere maybe in Chicago, it should be zero. Why don't they if they want to test to see if this if people wouldn't buy things in different places in that board, why don't they try that? It's not going to work. If you have to have a 60% of the people in the state have to vote to overturn it, right? And the the rates I saw them uh, started to under 250,000, 250, they go up. It comes up to almost 8% at the high. Have they ever changed the rates in Illinois on taxes? I mean, right? I mean, it went from, we were at 3.75, it went to 4.95. So they'll change those rates just depending on how much money they want to steal, right? So so if, 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 this, is a, if this is a predicator, let's just say, if, if there was an article, uh, Flee Loss of Illinois um, Residents uh, Predates Tax Increase. Right, so this is before they talked about rate increases. So in two th the article says in 2015 and 2016, roughly 43,000 filers did not file taxes in Illinois than they did the previous year. 43,000 less. Okay? So let's, let's kind of look at the numbers. Let's assume you had 43,000 people who did file taxes in Illinois, right? And let's just assume that they made, that those filers made $50,000. Right? That's over $200 billion. At 5%, that's $100 million. That disappeared. And it wasn't just for that year because your prior that's for one year. And if we just want to say, that, okay, that was an anomaly for that year, well, guess what? You lost $100 million in 2015, 2016. You lost $100 million in 2016, 2017. You lost $100 million. So cumulatively, you've lost over a half a billion dollars, right? But taxes don't matter. Right? So, I mean, these are just, these are the numbers. Illinois is the number one state for people leaving. Illinois, right? Um, the biggest, um, uh, Florida is one of the bigger ones. Why do people go to Florida? Warm, and their tax rate is zero. Right? That's one of the reasons why Tennessee, a few years ago, changed their, um, their tax law, and the number of people moving to Tennessee is tremendous. I mean, I think Nashville, I think, I thought I heard the number in Tennessee is like 10,000 people a day. Something like that moved into Tennessee in some area for it. So, and, and those people are coming from somewhere, right? I mean, it's not all organic. I mean, there's, there's people moving there from places, right? So, as you continue to go along this path, you're going to continue to lose more and more of a population area for it because people make decisions based upon what it's going to cost. Right. Um, those are just the in, those are just the individual rates. We're also talking about raising corporate rates, right? Um, so if corporate rates go up for it, um, there was an article in the paper that said um, there was a. Uh, I found this interesting. This is a company based in Elmhurst, right? So Elmhurst-based food maker plans a three hundred and ten million dollar plant built where? In Indiana, right? Elmhurst, right there in Illinois. Plant based. Last time I, Illinois was a big agricultural state. Last time I checked, it, right? Um, but yet they're going to build it in Indiana. Any reasons why? Taxes. You probably got incentives for it, right? It's a three hundred and ten million dollar plant, right? That would have brought jobs for construction and then to build the plant and then obviously the people yes, yeah, to work in the plant, for it, right? So. More and more of these issues that they keep talking about, you keep driving more people away, then you're going to have less people here. So the question really should be Illinois doesn't have a tax issue, Illinois is a population issue. Right? So I mean, you have more people leaving, then that money's going away. Their taxes are going away, right? And therefore, where if you had a situation, let's just use Tennessee kind of as an example, if they have people coming into it, you've got more people coming in, well then guess what? You don't need the race and you've got the revenue in that port, right? Does anybody remember back when the tax rate in Illinois was 2.75%? 
Way back when, it was 2.75 for that. Anybody remember what happened when Edgar and Daly got together and they were going to have the temporary tax? It went to like 3.5%. It was only going to be temporary for three or four years or so. Right. Only going to be temporary. I looked at my wife and I said, I've never known a temporary tax. I mean, you know, so. And then what happened? Well, then it expired and they said, well, we can't do without that money. We're just going to keep that tax in there. And then tax rates have gone up. And the more that they've gone up, the more people have left, right? So one of the interesting, if you look at the numbers that they came up with for what they said the estimated income would be in, does anybody know what they, if they were to tax at the current rate, estimated what the amount of money would come in from retiree taxes, so pension, social security, net. right now it's not taxed. Does anybody, they, they had a number the last time they, they put the last tax. That number was around three billion dollars. Okay. Now, what the, what are they estimating for this new tax to bring in? About three billion dollars. Right. So what they're essentially saying is we're going to try and exempt the uh, retirement tax, right? We'll just try and shift that tax over to somebody else. Right. Long term, what they're going to end up doing is they're going to drive those people who are working in those businesses if they raise those taxes, like this company in Elmhurst that's building their plant now in, in uh, Indiana, as opposed to building that in Illinois, they're going to drive them away. And the more they drive them away, once they leave, generally they're not coming back. Right. So I, I told my wife that my biggest concern is that five years from now, we won't be able to sell our house. Because if population is leaving, the population is not coming in, who's going to be there to buy the house? So it's not that my house will be worth less, it just will be worthless. <laughs> All right? It's not going to be that, it, that it's going to go down, it's just not going to be able to get rid of it. Right? So it's worthless at that point. Right? So as they start to have those things come along, you have other issues. The other one of the other areas that they had, this was an article that talked about in the state, there's a state minimum for a teacher that they get paid thirty thousand dollars for some areas in the state just has a lot of money, they don't have a lot of business now for it. Well the house voted to raise the minimum pay to forty thousand dollars. Teach minimum. What happens with property taxes if you just if I decide to build today and say we're gonna raise that and I'm gonna, you're gonna have to pay more Where's that money going to come from? We're most of the property tax. So we're talking about raising income taxes, right? This is going to cause a mandatory, a massive mandatory increase in wages, which means you have increase in property taxes, right? So if you increase income taxes and you increase property taxes, maybe they'll let me keep a dollar, <laughs> right? I mean, if, we, if they if they keep going down this path, and I just find it interesting that the guy who, did, who evaded taxes in Illinois in Cook County is the guy telling me that I don't pay enough, right? So so you, you, if you look at it in those terms for it, now anybody have did it rain here the last couple of days? Uh -huh. Did it rain here the last couple of days? Rain? Right. It had a little bit of rain, right? So, um, there was the article on it. Um, there is going to be. Here it is. Um, <laughs> the Democrats' rain tax. A rain tax. So, there's a tax. Your paper. Democrats rain tax. So I used to joke that they would tax air if they could. Yeah. It's one of the elements I'm calling. But air is that point for air. So there's so the proposal is that they're going to start taxing rain. I don't know all the details as far as the specifics on how they're going to tax it, but they're going to start taxing rain. And in the article, it was in the article it said something like I don't to go through, but I think it was like 50% of rain doesn't head into the sewer system. It basically hits like land, right? It goes into your grass or your trees or whatever, right? You look very puzzled over there, but I, I'm not making it up. I, I mean, this is, you know, article here. It's in the black and white, right? So, so we've got income taxes, we've got property taxes, we've got rain taxes. Um, there probably will be air taxes soon. I mean, they'll find some way to, to tax that for it. Um, I did read an article yesterday. How many think you don't pay enough for your little sticker that goes on your car? <laughs> oh, don't tell me that's going up again. That's they want. They want to change. They want to raise that to one hundred and fifty dollars. I think it was. What? 
Also, the gas tax they want to increase, right? They want that to go up by um, 50 cents right. a gallon, I think, I saw somewhere for it. Um, and it's because the people who have um, electric cars at that port aren't buying gas. Right. And I said, well, why don't you raise their little sticker then to like a thousand dollars? Yeah, why? Let them pay. Let, let them pay for their. Since they're not, you know, since they're not paying it, right? Let them raise that sticker price because they do it for trucks. Right. If you have a pickup truck versus a, a bigger truck, you pay a different tag. Well, yes? You say you will still be a tax. Oh, in Chicago? So, but people will still do that. They won't go anywhere else and get their, their water. Right? Um, it's like the soda tax, right? When they had, oh. when they implemented the Cook County had the soda tax, oh. what, the, the reason, you know why they were, they, why they did away with that, right? Because right. people stop buying soda in Cook County or That's buying right. soda in, in somewhere else. <laughs> but taxes don't matter. Taxes don't matter because you know people won't change their habits. If they if this, God forbid, should pass, what you probably will see is in the first couple of years, you will see that until people can actually make the change. Right? And then, so because people may not be able to do it immediately. But at some point in time, they will just make the change and decide to decide to jump in that part, right? But Milton, just like yes. they said, the toll on the toll road because I used to live there uh -huh. when I was growing up. After so many years, there was going to be no more charges. Now they still charge. Still so so the, the comment was about the toll roads when they were first put in, right? It was supposed to be after 20 years, I think right. it was, that they would be paid for in that for it, right? Um, now it's, I don't know, 50 years later, and we still have them, right? Um, and then they keep going up, the polls keep going up for it, right? So um, so it's just a matter of where does, at what point in time does it end that you're not going to be able to have any money left over? And if, you, and if these increases are there, and they're taking away disposable income, then the question is, where does the, where do you, if you want to make this thing change, let's not let's say get ahead, just maintain where you're at. If you have all these additional expenses that come in that are imposed, right? They're not choices; they're imposed at that point in time. Then one of two things has to happen: either your income has to go up to potentially cover this, right? Um, or you have to change what you're doing, right? Because that's the only way to make sure that everything stays where it's at for, right? So, um, I was trying to find another article here for it. Uh, oh, this was, this was an interesting one. Um, McDonald's has sizzling sales. What do they have on the front page? Uh, well, there's there's two individuals, but what's more importantly, remember about I, last month they said McDonald's bought a company that was technology, right? In the in their in the in the picture here for it, they have the huge kiosk where you can go up and it says order and pay here, right? Order and pay here, right? Okay. The faster they want the fight for 15, the faster they're going to see these more and more about, right? Um, so the technology change will happen with it, and they're going to force it into it. And you understand why they want the 15, right? The 15 has nothing to mean that people make more money. What happens if you make $5 more? They tax it, right? So think, if you make $5 more, the state right now gets 75 cents from Because they get five, 5 cents. If you get, you gotta pay state, you gotta pay federal taxes, you gotta pay social security taxes, Medicare taxes, right? You gotta pay all those taxes more. So at the end of the day, if they raise the gas tax, you know, you'll be paying money for that for it, right? Um, if they raise the rain tax, you'll be paying money for that, so what are you gonna account for, right? So, as you start to look at it more and more, at least in Illinois, you're having these issues where it's just a tax and spend area for it, and you can only, you know, just you can't change. I just can't write. I just can't write checks and not have money in my checkbook. Right? Bad things happen if I do that. So, um, but they don't seem to have any problem with it, and that's just going to be part of what is happening, right? 
So, um, and then nationally, but you may have heard um, at the same time that uh, Elizabeth Warren, I think it was, so she was or whoever one said you didn't have to pay for school anymore, um, and that you heard that Social Security is out of money when? 2034, right? Right, and at that point in time, uh, people will receive basically, they don't make any changes, uh, roughly about a 25% drop in your Social Security benefits. Right. There'll be a drop. And, Pardon me? It's going to drop the our money. If they if they don't make changes to make the system solvent, and that for it, roughly 2034 by the last estimates, um, it will be in basically everybody will get a 25 percent cut. The previous the previous year, um, I think three or four years ago, it was 2039. So now it's 2034, and with actually most likely going to be lower than that because the biggest number of baby boomers has yet to hit Social Security. So the biggest number of baby boomers was, were basically born from, I think it was 57 or 63 is the biggest concentration of baby boomers. Not that baby boomers didn't start here, right? But the biggest concentration is there for it. So they haven't hit Social Security yet. So when they hit Social Security, if all of them hit at the same time, basically, for it, all of a sudden that could accelerate them. Yes? What about Medicare? Is Medicare supposed to know about 2026? 2026. So you want a government health run system? Medicare is it. And it's out of money in 2026. So what I think is going to happen, my personal opinion, right? Um, right now, you know, if you're a single filer and you make more than 85000 or a married couple filing joint, 170000 there is a penalty for making too much money on your Social Security, right? So if you're a single filer um, and you make $85,000 for it, you will pay an extra roughly $57 a month for Medicare and another $13 for Medicare Part E, so about another $800 a year because you made $85,000. Um, I personally think what they're going to do is put a lower number in there, um, 55000 60000 whatever number, um, and then they won't be necessarily $55, maybe it's $40, $30, or something there, because if they do that, then they can collect, they can collect, not collect premium, you just made too much money. And then they collect that money and potentially have Medicare more solid. Right? Um, Medicare, they already changed the rule well, 10 or 15 years ago, where our Medicare is taxed all the way up on all income that you make. So Social Security only goes up to, I think, about 132000 this year. But Medicare, whether you make $100,000 or $10 million, you pay 1.45% all the way through. And so does your employer. So, you know, as you look at these potential reductions in income for it, or cost increases, the question becomes, where does that other money come from? Um, they have, they're going to do something. Um, I don't know when. Um, usually, the one last time we went through this crisis was back in 1983, um, and they made the changes starting in '84. That's when you had they changed it where they had a cost of living increase for it, and they also changed the ages to 66, and then 66 two months, four months, six months, all the way up to you got to 67 for it. There's been discussion about making that change a similar change as well. Um, literally in five minutes they can make the change and it would be, you know, save, most likely save Social Security. Uh, Medicare is another potential issue though. The problem with Medicare from a cost standpoint is the Medicare hold harmless provision says that you cannot increase Medicare premiums any more than you increase Social Security benefits. So they can't take, if somebody's in the system in Medicare, uh, and they're, let's say, paying $135 a month, maybe they should be paying 200 just picking that as a number for it, right? But the cost increase for bids does not allow them to go, so maybe they go to 136 or 138 or something like that. But the new people coming in could potentially come in at, let's say, $200. Right? So they're coming in at 200 and once they're in at 200 so to speak, they're locked. They can't go to 250 because only what the increase in Social Security. So those of you who are on Social Security, um, last year probably saw you, you got the increase, right? And don't forget the big print here, the small print to take it away, right? So for most of you, you probably saw an increase maybe in Social Security, but then you also saw your Medicare premiums increase, right? 
So, you know, the net, I think, on a, on a monthly basis was like you got to keep like five extra dollars. Like that. But don't worry, they don't want to take care of that. <laughs> so, um, so you don't have to worry about that. None of that extra money. We don't want that around. Um, so when you start to look at some of these other aspects that are out there for it, um, you know, it, it's a matter of looking how do we then take a look at the funds that you have to make sure that those are going to do what you want to do for you. And if potentially you do see increases in property taxes or water taxes or that part, right, um, that you're now in a position to have additional income coming in to potentially cover that. And so it's just a matter of being able to look at what we have and then be able to make sure that it's in the right place to do what we need so that should we need access to it, we've got the ability to generate the additional income. Yes? Question. What do you think will happen to our young people who do not have sure. pension and Social Security if it goes out or whatever? What happens? So, so the question is, um, what about uh, younger people with regard to what, what kind of happens to them for retirement? Right. Um, well, 401k plans, 403bs, IRA accounts are basically a replacement for pensions. You're funding it yourself, right? So it's a self-funded pension. It's not a corporate pension at that point, right? Um, the number of corporate pensions is down to very very few compared to what it was 20 years ago. In that point. Social Security, if it should, if they should not make any changes, basically would still be solvent for about another 50 years. Yeah. Right? Because what, essentially what would happen would be um, the people that are paying, working paying payroll taxes, would basically that money would just come in and essentially just go right out. Right? So a dollar would come in and a dollar would go out at that point. Um, after 2088, I don't know if the projections didn't say at that point. Um, most of you talk to most millennials at this point, but they don't think that Social Security will be there in that form. Um, it will be there in some form or fashion. Now, that being said, just so you understand, Social Security is a benefit, right? It is a benefit. Supreme Court ruling says benefits can be changed, altered, or eliminated at any point in time. Now, I'm not saying they're ever going to get rid of Social Security. Now, I'm saying, right? But benefits can change. Public benefits. That's why the big question, what happens when a public pension defaults and goes out of business? Well, we're going to find out in a couple of years when the requirement goes out, right? Because at that point in time, by Supreme Court ruling, nobody's responsible. Right? Nobody's responsible to make that payment. It's not a requirement at that point. That doesn't mean there's not going to be a lawsuit or anything like that. You can't get blood out of a term, right? So those are re those are the realities of it. Now, there was an article um, last month that talked about in Illinois, there's two systems for um, public pensions. There's tier one and tier two. Basically, tier two was, um, is anybody that was hired, I believe, after 2011. Right. So if you're hired after 2011, you're tier two. Now, let me ask you this. If I was to take your money and give it to him, would you think that that would be fair? Of course not. Doesn't sound fair. No. Okay. <laughs> tier two and tier two pension, they take two percent of your money to give it to tier one so that tier one doesn't go bankrupt as fast. And you never see that two percent. If you were a tier two person, would you be a little upset? Yeah. Okay. Why there hasn't been a lawsuit? Now, to me that's a Ponzi scheme, right? I mean in terms of taking your money to give it to them so that they don't so that they get paid first. No, you're not getting paid because nobody behind stealing other people's money to add to yours. Okay. The second part of that is, in the article, which I was not aware of, it said the, re the only way you're able to have a public pension is the public pension needs to be relatively equal to what someone would have received from Social Security. Makes sense, right? If you're not paying into Social Security, that whatever I would receive should be similar to what a Social Security benefit is. In the article, it also stated that in roughly 10 years, the way they have the tier two pension written, it will not qualify. Meaning that if you're a tier two pensioner, ready to retire, and they use paid teachers as an example, that the school district would need to make a lump sum payment for 10 years of work so that you could then receive your social security 
along with potentially your pension. Although I'm not sure if that would still hold because your pension, your Social Security would be reduced because of the windfall elimination provision. They didn't go into that detail. That being said, let's just think that in these terms, let's say somebody makes $50,000. Take that as a number of days now. Social Security is 12.4%, 6.2 for the individual, 6.2 for the employer, right? But they're not going to go back to the teacher and say, you have to come up with 10 years worth of 6.2. The school district is now going to have to come up with 12.4. So just for even numbers, let's just say $6,000 a year, right? 10 years worth of payment. That means they have to come up with $60,000 times how many people are potentially going to be retired. Let's say there's 10. Pick that as a number, right? So I had to come up with $60,000 for one. Now I have to come up with $600,000 today to be able to pay into the system so that they can come up and be able to pay that. Where is that, my example, $600,000 going to come from? Property, I, heard, I heard property taxes. I, I'm, I Most likely because that is where usually most, most teachers, most schools are funded. Right? The biggest portion is property tax. Right? So they've written a law that is that violates long term what's going to happen, which means that potentially people have to come up with more money. If you see that coming up, are you more likely to move into Illinois or move out of Illinois? Yeah. Right? So, I mean, so you, you look at the landscape of it, and if there's not major changes that are made, um, there's going to be problems. Right? And again, coming to you specifically, if they continue to have increases in costs that you're not anticipating, your income not going up or having enough, to, otherwise what happens, you have to start reducing your your principal, right? Because you, to, you just to make up, keep up with those paces. You keep reducing the principal, if your 100,000 becomes 95,000, it doesn't matter if I earn the same percentage because now I still have less money. Right? So that's why it's important to start to look at what we have to make sure that it's going to be there to generate enough cash flow and income for us on it. But we also have to be cognizant of different areas. My brother retired, um, he turned 65, retired last year, and therefore we put his plan together. I said, better for you to make 84000 than 86000 Because at 84000 he doesn't have to pay the Social Security penalty, right? The Medicare penalty. At 86000 two things happen and both of them are bad. First is he has to pay taxes on 86000 right? So he made $2,000 more. So he's got a couple hundred dollars in, in federal tax and maybe you know state tax, who knows what, right? Then he's got to pay his $800 a year or more in his Medicare. So making $2,000 at the end of the day is going to net like 500 bucks. So making that extra 2,000, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? So it's a matter of, again, looking, we have to look at the whole picture. It just can't be an isolated number. It has to be how does everything fit together. And that's when we work together to make sure we understand the whole picture on it because there may be certain times we want to shift income if possible to another year than doing it in one year. Right? Um, you can get the exemption if you're working and you're going on Medicare and your income is going to change. You can There's a form you can complete and send into Medicare so that you don't get hit with the penalty initially. So if you, as a married couple, if you're making more than that, or as a single filer, if you're making more than that, let's say you're making $90,000 now, which when you get into retirement, you're only going to make 60, just picking numbers at that point. There is a form in that that you can complete and send into Medicare so you don't get hit with that penalty as soon as you start taking Medicare benefits. Right. So these are all important issues that we just need to understand so that we're in a position to be able to have, to, to not take a decline in your standard of living. Because when they keep arbitrarily just raising taxes for it, right? Well, that has a direct impact on individuals, right? Um, and, I, and not that I'm suggesting they should tax retirees, but people with young families are also going to get taxed as well, right? 
And when my kids were younger, I needed every dollar I had to be able to buy diapers and formula and food and pay for school and all those things. So if my taxes continue to rise, well, I don't have money for those particular things. Something's got to give. And it's not got to give just because it's got to give. It's got to give because an arbitrary outside entity is telling me what I have to do. So, um, so it's, it's a very tenuous potential situation. We just need to make sure we understand your situation and now how we take these assets and all income is not the same. There's more certain ways to potentially generate cash flow and income, which may be better, may, may be more tax advantageous. And if it's more tax advantageous, then that means you could potentially have the same income, but not as much taxes for it and be able to avoid some of these other pitfalls. So those are things we can get to on an individual basis, um, but those are things we need to look at. It's taking that prism, kind of turning it a little, so we get a different outcome, even though the same light is hitting Yes. Well, they're trying to eliminate the teacher's pension. They, the mayor met with my daughters in teaching 28 years, and they met with the, with the mayor, and he's saying they want them to start a 401k, but they want to eliminate the pension. Now, she might be grandfathered in. I don't know. So, I mean, I, I don't, what they're, what they're going to do with the pension, I'm not sure. Um, teachers, Chicago, so TRS is out of money in 2029, the latest projection. CPS is out of money in, like, 2030. All right, so I mean, it sounds like a long way away, but it'll be here before you know. It, right? Um, and so the question becomes, where do these where do these monies come from to make the payments? And again, by Supreme Court ruling, public pensions are not guaranteed. They're considered benefit unless it's in a contract. Yes, Mr. Clayton, did you have it came up about closing the border, uh -huh. and uh, the thing that is the discussion was uh, vegetable, fruit and vegetable is high now. Should they close the uh, border up, people are not going to be able to buy fruit and vegetable here because it's going to be so high to ship that stuff around to get it to here. Then uh, it'll be better if the border open that day. Well, the, the border issue is more than it had to do with whether the border is open or closed. So trade's still going through. I mean, if they if yeah, they but they holding them, up things, holding up things. It can't. It, it could. It could potentially have increases. Are right now we're coming into the the growing season in the in the states, so to speak. So um, may not be as much of an issue. But yes, there may, there may be potential times when costs go up and you can't get certain things. It's no different than um, if there's a bad bad coffee crop. What happens to coffee prices? I mean, there's no difference. Ship it is coffee prices go up, right? But then what happens? People ship, right? There's alternatives. So instead of drinking coffee, they now drink tea. I think, right? Pick that as an example, right? So now, so now prices start to drop because there's not as much consumption. It comes law supply. So, um, so it's, I mean, this is these are just the realities so this week that we're dealing with right now with regard to it. We just need to make sure that in your situation, we if we're needing more income to cover something, that we've got things set up. Is it right now? Uh, any other questions? So, one, one last thing. Um, as, as many of you are aware, uh, my oldest daughter or my two daughters are um, professional athletes. Right? So, um, our oldest daughter ran the Boston Marathon on April 15th. For it. Um, she did really well. She finished um, ninth for the women. And um, she was the third American overall uh, woman in. Which means that since she was a top 10 in a major race, she doesn't have to run another one to qualify to go to the trials. So in uh, February 29th of next year, I believe, is the marathon trials in Atlanta. So, um, so here's just a, it's an article on my daughter. It says, you know, planning against the um, ninth place finish at Boston and have for it. So I didn't have anything to do with it. I just sat and watched and yelled at her. She couldn't hear me. So, uh, so she said that at the time she, she was about a mile. She was less than a mile out. She said she was 11. And somebody yelled to her that she was 11, and she didn't. She, she said she thought to herself, "I don't want to have to run this again this year." So she said, "I'm going to kick it into gear." Usually she doesn't have a kick at the end, but she had a kick, and she passed two people coming in um, and came at night. And she almost had a PR too. Um, she did it. She did Boston in 
um, 230.07. Um, her PR is 229 and some change in that for her. So if she, have, if she could add a PR at Boston and finish in top 10, that would have been like, you know, the trifecta. So, um, so it's just, uh, so it's a really, it was really a proud moment for us. Um, she, we, we saw her after we, so we our, our younger daughter happened to be there. She was able to be there for the race. Um, she was doing work in that for and She had, uh, she, my older daughter was able to get her a pass to get to see her at the finish line. And that was great. So, um, so it was pretty, it was pretty neat. And then we, we, we went and saw her um, over in the store. So, um, so it's pretty exciting in F4. So I know many of you know my children run in F4. And so, uh, so, you know, February 29th next year, she needs to be a top three. Uh, two, two run, and then one goes as an alternate. So hopefully she'll be numbered one or two, right? Um, but at least top three, then she'll at least be over in Tokyo. In so uh, just thought I'd give you some. You know,